for leading us in that moment. I truly appreciate it. Uh, this morning, we... So what we've done so far, um, we've picked two MLTs, that is uh, ministries that we're focusing on. Uh, the Ministry of Prayer, we've already um, had like uh, two sermons on that. And we had three sermons on the Ministry of Discipleship. We are transitioning into missions. And what we are trying to do is to make sure that collectively we understand these ministries that we are trying to cultivate or trying to emphasize and nurture uh, for, for our ministries here in our local congregation and to Moses Lake and to Central Washington and to Washington State and to the United States and to the other parts of the world. If you understand that, you can put a scripture in what I just said now, and it's Matthew 28. That is what we are going to be focusing on, participating in God's mission uh, this Sunday, next Sunday, and the coming Sunday. Three Sundays in a row uh, in the month of October, we'll be focusing on mission. What is mission? What is mission? Uh, what I had intended to do today, and I have announced it all through, is to say today was going to be a pause to be able to evaluate what we've done from July to date, and I requested that you send me questions if you have questions from the sermons that we've preached. Uh, I did not receive any, so um, we'll move on. So the goal of, the, of today's sermon is to define mission and to examine closely Matthew 9, 35 to 38, how we are participants in God's mission. As we seek to establish our mission efforts here at Moses Lake Alliance Church, we want to be sure that everything we do is grounded in the word of God. So what is mission? What is mission? The word mission comes from another word, the missio day. It's actually uh, a term that has been emphasized of recent in, in scholarship, particularly for those who are into um, uh, the missiologists uh, who study missions. I have talked about this missio day uh, on July 14th. I talked about it on July 14th when I preached on the second part of the theme. Our theme is saved to serve, joining God in his mission. And what I did in early uh, July was to look at what is salvation and what is service. And we also looked at what does it mean joining God in his mission. And during that very particular sermon, I defined what the Missio Day is all about. So what is the Missio Day? What is the Missio Day? So, so, you got to be good students. <laughs> good. It, it looks like what? Okay, well, I asked, uh, what language is it? It's Latin, you are right. It is. But what does it mean? God's mission. That's exactly what it is, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Distinction. You have A, brother. Candy. Yeah, no candy, unfortunately. But yes, it is the mission of God, and it is Latin. It actually means literally the mission, the mission of God or the sending of God, the sending of God. And uh, this Latin understanding is derived from the biblical term, or, the, uh, or I mean the biblical text, John chapter 20, verse 21, where Jesus said, as the Father sent me, or as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So see, I actually talked very briefly from that very particular text to say, what does it mean? How did the fathers, and I said, maybe it might be a good thing one day, we actually take a theme and explore, especially from the Gospel of John, to see how did John Gospel narrate and present to us the way Jesus understood his sending, his mission, how God, how the Father sent him, because that was what defined his ministry. He understood exactly how the father sent him and why the father sent him, and he executed exactly that, and then he said to his disciples, as the father has sent me, I am sending you. 
mission is about the redemptive work of God. So listen to this. Mission is about the redemptive work of God in his creation throughout history. It's not just a New Testament issue. I'm going to say that very briefly later on. But through his son Jesus and his church. So it was his son who said, as the father has sent me, I am sending you. When he commissioned his disciples in that, we already know in chapter 17 of the book of John, he is prayed, he has already prayed. He said, Father, I am not just praying for these ones, referring to the disciples, but he said, I'm praying for those who will believe in me through them. That is the church. We are an outcome and a product of that prayer. We've been prayed for. Just like Peter. When Peter said, even if the rest of the disciples, even if the rest of my brothers will desert you, I will not. And Jesus said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like chaff. But you know what he said? I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. We've been prayed for. Brothers and sisters, we have been prayed for by the one who founded the church, Jesus Christ. He prayed for us. And one of the key things that he prayed for us, he said, I pray for their unity. I pray that they may unite. Just as you, Father, and I are one, may they be one so that the world may know that you have sent me. We are a product of prayer. The church participates in the mission of God through proclamation and deeds of the gospel. That is what I am going to focus on on this Matthew chapter, 35, uh, chapter 9, verse 35 to 38. I'm going to focus more on the proclamation aspect and the deeds aspect. We will be looking at that next week, God willing. But it is important to point out that mission, like I said, is not a New Testament idea. Sometimes when we talk about the Great Commission, we think as if that is the beginning of mission. No. If mission, as we are emphasizing, is God's mission, it didn't start after the resurrection. It's been part of God's plan for the redemption of humanity. In fact, you remember in one of the sermons I preached, I said, this very particular act of redemption, the gospel, the cross, was not an afterthought in the mind of God after the fall in Genesis chapter 3. No, no, no. We read several scriptures that says this very particular gospel, this salvation, was planned before the foundation of the world. Before time existed. So the the cross, and I said at that time that the cross stood in the heart of God. This was a quotation from someone. The cross stood in the heart of God before it physically stood at Gogolta. So it wasn't accidental. It wasn't coincident. It was planned. And it was planned by the master planner. From creation, God has always walked with humans, graciously sharing himself as someone pointed yesterday in our Bible study. If you get tired, especially you men, if you get tired hearing me quoting what we learn in our Bible study, then you should come. If, you, if I see you there, I will not be quoting what I learned there. But this is your pastor saying, I learn from our from our Bible study, graciously sharing himself as someone pointed out yesterday in the men's Bible study. It is about God revealing himself to humanity uh, so we may reconcile to him. Again, I'm referencing 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. Time will not permit me to read it, but I've already mentioned about this very particular scripture on this pulpit. That we have been reconciled with God our, our, we were enemies with God. We were enemies of him. But he reconciled us through the cross. 
And by this reconciliation, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And so that Paul is literally saying, we beg people and say, hey, there is danger ahead. We plead with people. We ask people. We tell people. We proclaim and say, there is danger. But God has made a way out. That is the gospel we preach. That is the message we carry. And that is what we plead with people to come back and reconcile with God. We can be at peace with him as he designs it to be. So, those who study missions will say God is a missionary God. And his mission work did not just start after the fall. His mission work started even before the fall. As you read in Genesis 1, 28, there he said that he created man in his image and gave them dominion to rule over the rest of creation. The story of Noah. Well, of course, in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 15, we're told that he, after he, 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 he made the creation, almost like a second story of the creation, he created a garden east of Eden, and he took Adam and Eve and put them there to tend the garden, to care for the garden, to cultivate the garden, to, 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 to keep the garden. God, who created everything, created a garden and then he took Adam and Eve and put them there to tend it, to care for it. The story of Noah is also another example from the Old Testament that shows that this mission did not start in the New Testament. Noah is called the preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Why is he called preacher of righteousness? Because God said the generation of Noah was so corrupt that every inclination of the heart of man was evil, and God was determined to destroy that generation. But he found Noah to be a man of righteousness. In, order, in fact, the name of Noah actually means grace. So Noah found grace before God. And therefore, God gave him the opportunity to build an ark and then not just only was he building an ark, because he was building an ark, people were asking, so what are you doing? He said, God is going to send rain. God is going to destroy the earth. You better repent. Your ways are wicked. But they laughed at him. They mocked him. They derided him. And sure enough, there was the flood that washed away that generation of Noah. You see, God wouldn't just wake up overnight and just wipe away a generation like that. He will always call them, give them the opportunity. That is the ministry of that was the ministry of the prophets. Even among Israelites, he didn't just send judgment overnight like that. Sometimes it took over a hundred years, two hundred years. And prophets upon prophets upon prophets upon prophets were calling the nation of Israel to repentance, but they will not, and the judgment will come. The call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, and Genesis, actually, I would, I would love us to read the one, Genesis 18. Let's look at that story. This is the story when uh, uh, Noah, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Abraham received visitors. And these visitors that he received, uh, as uh, I'm sure if you know this story a little bit, uh, you can't miss it that there is some sort of divine mystery going on there in the story. But let's read from verse 16 to 19. Listen to what it says. When the men got up, by the way, when, Ab when Abraham saw them coming, for whatever but Abraham was a man of hospitality. When he saw them coming, he recognized that these are guests, these are strangers, these are visitors. And he stood up and went to them and welcomed them into his house. And he ordered for his servants to prepare a meal and Sarah prepare a meal while they were discussing and chatting. 
uh, they said to Abraham, next year by this time, Sarah, your wife, is going to have a child. And Sarah overheard the conversation, and she laughed. <laughs> Me going to have a child? And they confronted Sarah. Why did you laugh? She said, I did not laugh. You did. Anyway, that is the story. If you've not read that story, go back and read the entire chapter. But look at where I'm interested in. These very particular three visitors, they were on an assignment. They were on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way, in order what to escort them. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Well, that is reference to chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised, what he has promised. And the rest of the story, when Abraham realized that these three men were on an assignment to go destroy Gomorrah, and he knew his, his uh, nephew Lot and his family live in that very particular plain area, Abraham started to intercede for the city. Again, we will not... Uh, but that is just to establish the point that the mission of God... In fact, if you, I think it's worth mentioning here just to see that, that our mission is for us participating in God in his mission. Because even in this assignment, it was his own mission to go to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham said, well, if you find 50 men who are righteous, will you destroy the city? Well, the answer was no. Well, were there 50 men who are righteous in Sodom? No. The countdown started from 50, was it 100? Of, you know, it started counting down up to 10, and there was no. So that city was doomed for destruction. But here's the point. Abraham interceded. And if there were 10 people, I am pretty sure the answer would have been, yes, uh, I will not, because that is where it concluded. He says, uh, verse 31, Abraham said, now that I have been bold, so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found and there was none? May the, Lord be, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just one once more. What if only ten can be found there? He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. Our God is a gracious God. For the sake of ten people, he will not destroy the city. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. In fact, as I'm saying this, it reminded me, you remember the story of Jonah. Jonah was sent to Nineveh. He was angry that God was interested in saving this wicked nation. And instead of heading west to Nineveh, I mean to Nineveh he headed east to Tarshish. Ended up in the belly of a fish, but ended up going. He went, he preached, repent or be destroyed. And we were told that the people of Nineveh repented. And guess what? Jonah was angry. And he went out, sat out, and he was angry with God. And God put a vine, or put first an east wind. So hot. You live in Africa, you know what I'm talking about. Even here in the summer, sometimes it's hotter than Africa. So that's what I'm talking about. Just hot wind. It is called east wind. It's, 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 it's um, hot and humid. 
And while he was angry with God, you know how sometimes anger can produce sweat. But anger and heat and all of that, and God provided a shade. And just as he was cooling down, God provided a worm that came out and aired every leaf of the vine. And Jonah was angry. And God asked him, so why are you angry because of this little worm that ate? He said, what about the city of Nineveh that has over 100,000 people? I will save it. And even if it is 10 people, I don't know why it stopped with 10. Because if it had come down to 8 or 5, Lord and his family would have hit the number. I don't think at that point he's going to come down to five. And perhaps Abraham knew, and he stopped at ten, and there was destruction in Nineveh. I'm sorry, in uh, uh, Sodom. Joseph. The story of Joseph is kind of very off. When I when I sat down and I put Joseph, and I said, you know, how how does this story match up with God uh, with with, with us participating with God in his mission. But actually, it matches well, very well. The story there, the verse 19 that I put there, it was actually Joseph's response to his brothers. When their father died, they were afraid. Now that their father is gone, they felt that Joseph was going to be vindictive. He was going to revenge the way they treated him. And they went to Joseph and actually told a lie. They say, our father said, when he dies, you should forgive us for what we did to you. And after he listened to them, he said, you know, I'm not in the place of God. You you did what you did to me. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, for the saving of the many. Do you see that? You meant it for evil. God meant it for good for the saving of this nation called Israel today. And in Psalms 8, where we read from our call to worship, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man, what is mankind, that you are mindful of them, human beings, that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers, Over the works of your hands, you put everything under their feet. Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servant, the prophets. Did you hear that? That the Lord does nothing without revealing those plans to his servant, the prophet. In Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8, Then I heard a voice, the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. So, mission is not a New Testament idea. God has been in the mission of redeeming the world, in the mission of rescuing the world, in the mission of redeeming, in a redemptive mission. That is what he's been all about. Trying to make sure that mankind is reconciled back to him. So how, what is involved in the church's participation according to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 38? Again, this text is worth reading it again as our sister has beautifully read it. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Remember last Sunday? He sent 72 in twos and said, go ahead of me into all of... He sent them ahead of him into all the villages because he was going to visit those villages. So 72 in twos, that would be 36. And if they went into maybe... If every two pers- uh, if those peers went into uh, two or three towns announcing, if it is just two of them to one town, that would have been 36 towns or 36 villages that Jesus Christ was planning on his mission outreach to reach, but he wanted to send uh, 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 a mission party ahead of him 
Uh, and that's what we see here, that Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues. Remember that the ministry of Jesus was limited to Palestine. He didn't go out of Palestine. It was limited because he came to the household of Israel, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every diseases and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask for the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So what is involved in this? I said, one, it's teaching. Teaching. Our participation in the mission of God involves teaching. Where do we learn it? From Jesus. Teaching just simply means imparting knowledge, instructing with the goal to inform or to educate, giving information, either to something that there's some sort of elementary understanding of it. In, in fact, that's how our, our school system are structured. Our school system are structured so that one, I mean, our level of education is built from one level to another up until you graduate from college. But there's some sort of assumption in the curriculum as it is built up from one grade to another to another to another because you cannot teach calculus. I don't know what that is. I never did it, and I will never do it. <laughs> but I know you will not teach calculus to a certain age group in the educational process because it will be a waste of time and will probably damage some people understanding and make them hate math or whatever. But we do teaching in order to impact knowledge. And so Matthew, if you look at the structure of Matthew, chapter 4 kind of gives us summary of, of what, in, in fact, in chapter 4, he actually tells us in chapter 4 that the preaching of Jesus, the proclamation is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. That was the message that Jesus was proclaiming. And for the Jews, they understood exactly what that means. The kingdom of God they understand that. And so Jesus is saying, repent, for that kingdom is near. And then, chapter 5, 6, and 7 is what we generally call the sermon on the mount. It's teaching. In fact, he went up on the hill and sat down and decided to teach the people. So teaching is what characterizes his ministry. Proclamation is telling with passion as to inspire conviction and repentance. And that is why you see him saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And many people repented. In fact, people repented in the days of John the Baptist because he was the forerunner. He was the one who actually prepared the way and he also used the same word, repent. And we're told that people came and all in all areas and John baptized them. Repent. Repentance is required. And so teaching to help them understand and also proclaiming to bring conviction that will lead to repentance. Matthew illustrates this with the sermons on the mount and with his parables. The parables that we read in Matthew, but even also the parables that we read in the Gospel of Luke and Mark, all of those were moments of teaching so that the people will understand. Paul had a similar pattern. Even though he understood his calling as an apostle to the Gentiles, yet we see him in synagogues, just like Jesus. When Paul goes to even the Gentile cities where there are Jews in diaspora, he will locate where they are meeting. He will locate where their synagogues are, and he will go there 
and sit with the Jews and argue with them with the goal of presenting and convincing them that this Jesus Christ is the Christ. This Jesus is the Christ. That is the purpose. In Acts chapter 9, 19 verse 8 to 12, we read this. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussion daily. It's almost like had teaching, had to have teaching daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who live in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Even his handkerchiefs that touched him, even aprons that touched him, they were taken back and the sick that were not there were healed. Those that were demon-possessed were delivered. Amen? This is the work of God. This is the power of the gospel. That is the demonstration of the gospel. And we see that in the life of Jesus, and we see that in the life of the apostles. But then still talking about Paul and his passion to draw people to the gospel. Look at what in, 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 in Acts chapter uh, 26, during his trial before Agrippa. <laughs> Agrippa asked him, Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, Agrippa, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Amen? Except for these chains. I don't want people to be, to be, to be in chains. Who, who wants to be in prison? Nobody. In fact, a friend of mine, the guy who visited us here, he's a lawyer. And he said to me, he has one of his friends who is a lawyer too. His law, I mean his practice, he doesn't go to court. His area of uh, practice is police stations. If there, he goes to police stations seeking for people who are sitting behind bars and working to release them. And he said to my friend that, you know, People love freedom. People like freedom. Nobody wants to sit even in the, behind the counter with the police. People like freedom. And he understood that. And he would go to police station from one police station trying to rescue people and strike a deal and get money out of that. That is his own practice of the law. What I'm just simply saying here, Paul says, I want not just you, Agrippa, but everyone seated here listening to me. I want them to be like me, free. Because they will be reconciled with God, except for these chains. No one wants to be a prisoner. Paul at that time was already arrested, and he was on his way. When the trial was going back and forth, it got to a point he understood who he was. He knew he was, I mean, he, he used his uh, Roman citizenship and appealed to Caesar. Once that appeal was made, all the people in the prison had no right to touch Paul but to send him to Caesar in Rome. And you also need to read the book of Acts to see what happened. Well, that is not the end of the story. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Let me uh, again just show you what it means to be passionate about this gospel and to participate with God with passion in our proclamation, that that would be a vision and, 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 and a calling that we should, because we have our mantra here that go live the call. Well, what is that call? This is what we're talking about. Go live it out. Look at what it says in, in, in Romans chapter 9, verse 1. It says, I speak the truth in Christ. 
I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from the Christ, I mean from Christ, for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. This is the adoption to the sonship, I mean to sonship. This is divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and all the promises. These are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. Amen. Look at that. Paul, if you understand the implication of what he's saying here, that I could actually be cursed if I were to go to hell, to eternal damnation, but that the unbelief and the obstinacy of the people of Israel would be delivered from them, I am willing, this is how passionate Paul was, that he could go to destruction, to eternal condemnation, if only that is going to make the people of Israel believers. Well, if the cross didn't make them believers, Paul, who are you? Who are you? But that is to tell you the heart of Paul. Turn to the next chapter, chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. And that is why he tells us in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. First to the Jews. And he goes on there to quote Habakkuk, talking about righteousness. We've already mentioned uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13 to 15, where he talks about us being reconciled to God. But this, so it involves, so this whole participation in God's mission involves teaching, involves proclamation, but it also involves healing. This third aspect of the gospel demonstrated by Jesus and the apostles is healing which is the demonstration and the evidence of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. In fact, the healing that Jesus Christ performed and the authority and power that he bestowed on the disciples and said, go and preach and heal every disease and deliver people is a testament to the fact that this kingdom of God has come. That is why when they accused him of doing the healing in the power of Beelzebub, he said, if I do this, by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. The kingdom of God has come to you. This aspect of healing is actually called the demonstration of the gospel through deeds. And it's encompassing. It's not just healing alone. It's acts of mercy, justice, and all of that. And we will talk about that next week, God willing in Luke chapter 4. So please read Luke chapter 4 in preparation for how we participate in God's mission part 2. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 2 next Sunday. This participation in God's mission involves seeing. Seeing. Look at what, that's what we read in this, in this text. When he saw the crowd. Did you see that? That's what we read. Turn with me to that text that we have, chapter 9 of Matthew. He saw the crowd. He saw the crowd harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. You know, sheep by nature are vulnerable to ferocious beasts. The story of David, <laughs> when, he, when, he, when he visited his brothers in the battlefield, and he saw Goliath coming every day to taunt his people. And no one stood up 
to go confront Goliath. And he said to Saul, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I'm going to go fight him. <laughs> and Saul said, you want to go what? I want to go fight him. Do you know who he is? I don't care who he is. I am a shepherd boy. I am a shepherd boy. When the lions or the bears will come and attack my sheep, I follow them, I pursue them, and I will grab them and hit them and kill them and save the sheep. The God who delivers me from these lions and these bears, he will deliver me from this uncircumcised human being. That is a demonstration of a shepherd. If sheep do not have a shepherd, they are vulnerable. There will be dinner, there will be breakfast, there will be lunch for the animals. If you have time during the week, read Ezekiel chapter 34. There is the indictment of the shepherds of Israel. There is the indictment of the leaders of Israel who exploit the sheep, who milk the sheep, who eat from the sheep and do not shepherd the sheep. It's an indictment. And it is some of those scriptures that Jesus is referring to, but the one that is actually in the Pentateuch is Numbers chapter 27. You don't have that written on the, uh, on the screen, but you can put that down. Numbers 27, verse 15 to 17. Listen to what it says. This was the transition where uh, God tells Moses, you cannot go to the promised land. Appoint someone who will lead the people to the land because you are going to be gathered to your people in the way your brother Aaron has gone because you disobeyed me when I commanded you to speak to the rock. Hear what it says. Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in so that the, uh, the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. This was probably where the Jews were actually referring that when they have a leader over them, that leader is actually leading them so that the congregation and the community of God's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. In the time of Jesus, as Jesus looked at the congregation, he looked at the people, he had compassion over them because they were harassed. They were harassed by who? They were harassed. I don't think that Jesus was talking about the Romans at this point. They were talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who will harass the people with the laws that they themselves are not keeping. So the people were harassed, and Jesus sees through that. And I just want to simply ask the question, when you move in Moses' lake, do you see the people harassed? seeing people and their needs of the gospel. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, I wish we have time. Again, read that chapter. But in Mark chapter 6, we're told that Jesus was teaching in one side of the Sea of Galilee, and as they've, they've been teaching all through, and they were tired, and Jesus sent the disciples ahead, and then they crossed to the other side so that they will rest. That was actually the mission. They were crossing on the other side by themselves so that they would go and rest because they have been spending the whole day teaching and ministering to the people. The people saw them crossing and they left this way and went the other way and actually by the time they crossed, the same crowd was already gathered on the other side. And... <laughs> The Bible says, when Jesus went and saw the crowd, exactly this quotation is said, he had compassion over them because they were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And you know what it says? And he started to teach them. He started to teach them. He has finished teaching them this way, 
and went the other way and started to teach them. And as the sun was setting, the disciples probably were tired and they went to Jesus. Can you send them? Let them just go. Because it's, it's, it's late and um, there is no place here to, for them to have food and all of that. S- send them home. And Jesus said, you give them food. You give them food. He said, what? This crowd? Even if we are to have one year salaries of all of us, it won't fit them. He said, what do you have? <laughs> it's like probably the dinner they had gone to eat. That's what Jesus Christ was asking. Well, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, okay. Ask the people to sit down. We'll have dinner here together. You you know the story, right? But see, he saw them first as sheep, as harassed, as sheep without a shepherd, and he started to teach them. The last point that we need to, or second to the last point that we need to see is that not not, not only seeing the people harassed, but also seeing the harvest as Jesus sees it. The harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are few, and I, I sat down and I was thinking, I said, God, if the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few, why do we have to pray? Honestly, I mean, again, you remember that in the gospel it says, before a word comes out of our mouth for prayer, he knows what we're about to say, right? But do you know what he say? He said, pray. So why do I have to pray if you already know what I'm going to say? Well, he said, pray. Pray. Here, he says the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest field. It's not our harvest field. It's not ours. It's his And as I was thinking about it, I said, you know, truly speaking, he can't send me, well, he could have. But there are some African countries that I can't go to preach because I don't speak French. I went to to Nigeria Republic when I was a pastor back in Nigeria. I led a team of mission, short-term missions to Nigeria Republic in Galmi area simply because they speak Hausa. So I could speak Hausa. Otherwise, if I had gone to Naomi or other parts uh, and to speak with the people, it's probably I would have to speak through an interpreter because Nigerian Republic speak French as an official language. Well, it is God who knows who speaks French that he can send to Nigerian Republic. It is God who knows. Do you know that there are some people who naturally are very good in learning language? There are some of you, even if it takes you 100 years, you can't even learn the alphabets. But there are some people, just one short-term visit, they can learn the language and speak it fluently. There are people who are gifted like that. Only God who knows those kind of people here in this congregation right now. Probably you don't even know you have that gift. Sitting here, probably you don't know. But he who is the Lord of the harvest, who has the harvest field, also has the laborers. But he said we should pray. He is the one that is going to handpick the laborers and send them where the harvest is ready for harvest. And so he says, pray. You see Mrs. Gowan there uh, is the story of uh, my denomination. Uh, Maybe another time we'll talk about that. But let me conclude with the implications for Moses Lake Alliance missions. What is our focus? What are we trying to do? We we want to be sure that whatever we do is grounded in the word of God. I say here that our mission, our mission's efforts must be grounded in the teaching of the word of God like Jesus did and as the early church did too. We got to be people of the word of God. We got to make sure that this becomes our central focus, brothers and sisters. If we want to be a church that is rooted into God's mission, and we know we want to... See, I've, I told you here when I came candidating in, 
in February, and I was talking about the missions of God, I mean the mission of God. I said, see, when we go to sleep and we wake up, the implication of that is that God doesn't sleep. So when we wake up, it is we that we're supposed to ask God. Oh, say, God, I went sleeping for eight hours, and I'm waking up now. Where are you in your work? Where are you in your mission? It is we to ask, because Jesus said in, 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 in John chapter 4, my father has been at work. He's never stopped working. So we come and ask him, we come and look at Jesus and ask him, where, where are we in this mission of your work? That is what we want to say. Second, our mission must involve proclamation. So it has to involve teaching. It has to involve proclamation. You must have heard the saying attributed to Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. And I searched and they said that probably Francis of Assisi never said something like that. Because the contradiction is that there is no way you can preach without words. So preach. Preach a word. The third thing there is clear vision to see as Jesus sees. Again, I've already alluded to that. When you step out of this place and when you go to your workplace tomorrow, when you walk through the streets of Moses Lake, do you see the people harassed? Do you see the confusion in our culture? When you go to your school, do you see the confusion in our culture right now? The struggle that people have, understanding several things of life, sexuality and all of that. Do you see it? Does it worry you? Do you ask God, what is happening with our culture? What is happening with our time? Where are we heading? And lastly, we have to be faithful in prayers. Yes, it's one thing to see the people harassed, but it's another thing for us to do what we are asked to do. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Pray for the Lord of the harvest. Now, I emphasize teaching and proclamation today. Next Sunday, I'm going to emphasize deeds which involves healing, which involves acts of mercy, which involves justice, and all of those issues that we as Christian witness, our Christian witness had to, have to address those issues as part of knowing fully that this is the mission, that it is our God is a God of justice, and therefore our mission has to reflect his heart. And God willing, next Sunday, we will do that. So, mission is not ours. Mission is God's. Are you willing to participate with him, to join him in this mission?